Hello and welcome back to the game room. You know what I love? Video games. You know what I love talking about? Games. And it seems like a lot of people these days who cover games seem to hate them. Or at least the people who play them. Well, that's not me, and that's not the 1952 of you beautiful people checking out this video here today. We've had another banner week. Thank you guys so much. If you notice, I have lost my voice because I was screaming yesterday during the ridiculous Niners playoff win. Woo! Three NFC Championships here in a row. Hopefully we can get to the bowl and win it this time, but that's not why you're here today. I've been pretty negative the last few weeks talking about games you should skip and, you know, clickbait this, whatnot. So this week, I figured let's do it a little bit more positive and let's talk about some of my personal greatest moments in gaming. Now remember, these are mine, and I know some people think I tend to be a little spoiler heavy. Uh, I don't believe I have any spoilers in this video, but in general, I do try to be very judicious about what information I give. So yeah, I may say something that sounds like a huge spoiler, but in the long run of the game, it really isn't. Unless it's a game where it's just, don't play the damn thing because this spoiler is so terrible. But anyways, let's see what I think are the greatest moments in gaming. Bear in mind, these aren't going to be plot related for the most part. They're vibes, they're feels. There's a few that will be plot related, but more it's about just the overall sensation the game gave me. Alright, let's check it out. There's a lot of games out there, some of which you've never even heard of. That's where I come in. My name's Luke. I've been playing games since the age of two, and I have no life. This is my game room. So I want to start off with a game that really illustrates what I mean by this point, and that goes back to the original Final Fantasy VII. And with this game, this was the first true RPG I ever played and beat. Before this game, I had tried Super Mario RPG, and then the closest thing to an RPG I had played was Zelda II. With this game, I was noticing the levels, I was getting to the point of Midgar where you're about to uh, take on the Shinra Corporation, and then after you get past that point, typically in a game I was playing at the time, the game would be over. I think I'd put maybe, I don't know, 10 hours, something of that nature, who knows. But the game then opened up to a ginormous world map, there was so much content left, and I just kind of sat there flabbergasted. Uh, I think the next thing you do after you leave Midgar is you go to a cave. So traversing the world map, getting to the cave, and then seeing these these angles of just your characters walking so tiny through this giant landscape, and just realizing like, oh, when you get to level, I think you're level 15, 20 at this point, I'm like, wow, okay, it really does keep going up and up and up. Because I think in Mario RPG, it caps off at 30. So just that, that sensation, the fact that the game was not over, in fact, it had just started, was something that for myself, at, I want to say I was 11 or 12 when I played Final Fantasy VII. So that just really sticks in my head. And every time when I'm playing a game where I think it's over and it's not, it always comes back down to that sensation with Final Fantasy VII. Now, there's a similar one of those sensations that happens in Symphony of the Night, but we're not including that in this video because it's basically the same kind of feeling. But Final Fantasy VII is really the game that set that precedent and really, for myself, was probably one of the things that made me an RPG lover was that fact. That fact that, oh, there is so much game left to go. Let's get after it. Now, here's a fairly recent one. So, the video game Control is by Remedy Studios, the people who made Alan Wake. And this game is a trip. It has a very unique combat where you fire a gun that reloads itself automatically. But there's a lot of a lot of distortion between reality and what's not real. You're in this, this ministry, almost like the Men in Black, where it's super secretive. And they have control of these... These items that can dis distort time and space. And you keep hearing throughout the whole game about the the ashtray maze. Like once you get to the ashtray maze, stuff's going to go down once you get to the ashtray maze. So I was expecting it to be a wonderful sequence, but holy cow. 
getting into the ashtray maze, which is late in the game. Now, no spoilers on it. You're not spoiling it just to know that the ashtray maze, when you get to it, is freaking incredible. But you go in there and literally it defies the laws of physics that have been set throughout the game, which already the laws of physics have been going through the wazoo and is one of the most heart pumping intense sequences I can think of in a game in the last 10 years easily, if not ever. I mean, one of the things people love about the Sony Spider-Man games is you have these really intense sequences. Uh, a lot of games, like Uncharted, things like that have it. The Ashtray Maze takes that amazing set piece, but then integrates it into the lore and the purpose of the actual story. And it's just super cool. I mean, you're going through this thing and you just do not do not know what to expect. It is nonstop action. Uh, the music pumps in. It keeps it going. And it's just really, really a highlight of what for me was a kind of mid-game. But that alone took it and put it over the edge and made it from probably a 6 or a 7 to a solid 8, 8.5. I know other people love the game a lot more than I do. But oh, right there, the Ashtray Maze really is one of my favorite sequences in gaming in the last 10 years easily. All right, now here's one that, it's funny, you're going to see a lot of my favorite games of all time on, in this video and because of certain things that really embedded in me. And one of them is Toe Jam and Earl. The thing about Toe Jam and Earl is the fact that it was the first game I ever played that had roguelike elements. And for a long ass time, no games had roguelike elements again with the procedurally generated worlds where every playthrough was different. It just didn't really catch on until, I want to say, the indie scene of 2010s and things of that nature once he started playing um, games like Rogue Legacy and Spelunky and stuff like that. But for Toe Jam and Earl, what made it so special was the fact that you start the game on level one. Every time, level one is exactly the same, regardless. And as you play it, you start realizing that, you know, level four has a certain rule set, level six has a certain rule. Like, you start noticing the trends. It's not quite as random as you think. But what is so incredible is that level one holds some amazing secrets. It holds Present Island, and it holds a drop down to get to level zero where you can get a bonus life you can restore your health and one of the things that makes playing Toe Jam and Earl so enjoyable for me is when I'm going through the game usually around level six seven eight you know on your way to I think at 25 is usually where it caps off but it's always like when are we going down and getting to level zero because once you get to level zero you get a free life and then you can jump off the edge in level zero and it takes you back to the highest level you had been at and in order to get there, you need to use rocket skates, you need to use Icarus wings, or you need to use the rubber ducky. And it's always fun. It's always fun doing both of those. One of my favorite parts of that game and one of just the, my favorite moments, th this is what I'm getting at, this is one of the favorite moments is realizing that that entire world full of water, which in Dojim and Earl, when you uncover tiles and explore, you get experience points for your character and level up, and then they get more health and they get more lives and things of that nature. So doing this is also worth it because it gets you a whole lot of experience if you have a, several pairs of rocket skates. So that is just something that I really enjoyed. I never found a game that has had that kind of really cool mechanic where, you know, if you, it's one of those things where if you fall off, then it's like, all right, well, let's go to level zero now. Might as well. We already fell down two levels. So it just makes it very enjoyable. And man, I love that game. So here's one that is story-based. So I'm not going to get into the story, but what makes me love this game so much is that it really showed me, even more so than something like Final Fantasy VII, how much the story could hook you, and in a short amount of time. Because Final Fantasy VII was a 70-80 hour game. But Metal Gear Solid really felt like they took, say, the, the concept of Die Hard and they gamified it. So you got Solid Snake, you have this cast of characters from Psycho Mantis, Vulcan Raven, Decoy Octopus, Sniper Wolf, um, Liquid Snake, I think that's all of them. And just, they all have their own personalities. They're all based, oh, and of course, Gray, Gray Fox, Ninja. Like, they're all so cool. They are just, you know, of course, I was 11 or 12 when I played this too, but it just really hooks you in. The story never stops. It's about a six or seven hour game and just the vibe. So with this one, the vibe of it was just so, unlike anything I had experienced at the time. I mean, really the PS1 era is when we really started to see games go from platformers and RPGs and get more into this game as a movie type thing that you've seen now be progressed with the Uncharted, with the Last of Us, with GTA, the way it tells its story. And it really owes a lot, in my opinion, to Metal Gear Solid. And looking back, 
that was just one of my, like, just so enjoyable. And then the reveals that happen, the different things you have to go to get through it, the, the breaking of the fourth wall, having to look on the back, on the back of the case. It, it, it had its own DRM on the back of the case in order for you to reach out to, I think, Deep Throat. Okay, so another one of the PS1 era, which was just a moment because it scared the bejesus out of me, and I even had my wife do this with Noob Gamer. And a lot of these moments do come down to things I'd like to have Jen experience in Noob Gamer, which if you don't know is a series where I have my wife go through big moments, either infamous or famous throughout gaming, and then see how she handles it. And one of those was in Resident Evil 1, when you're going through the hallway early on in the game, either as Jill or Chris, and the dogs jump through the wall. And that was the first instance of a of a jump scare in a game for myself, but also one where you weren't expecting it. Like the 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 the, the exterior, the pre-rendered backgrounds had someone affect it and jump out of it. And you didn't see that before. I mean, in Super Nintendo games and things like that, maybe they they break out of a wall and you go into a sequence, but it just in a game like this was was so tense where you had a limited amount of resources and no way to actually fight you had to fight or flight, and generally when that happened, you ran your ass off to that end of the hallway, and then you didn't want to go in that hallway ever again. And it was so damn intense and so damn heart pumping. I mean, I did the damn thing to my wife like six years ago, and she almost had a heart attack. So it still has as much cachet even now to this day. And I just, I, I love that visceral feeling that I still think of when I think about the first time I saw that happen. And that's a lot of what the whole Resident Evil series was up until 3 as far as my memories with it. I got a lot of that in 1 and 2. Okay, so going to my, you know, I don't even know if this is my favorite game of all time anymore, but it's definitely top 5 still, top 3 easily. And that is Link to the Past. Now, the moment that I'm talking about is not the one where you get the Master Sword. That is a great moment. But the moment I'm talking about is that when you beat Aghanim and you get transported, you're not sure what the hell happened, you end up on the top of a pyramid. And then you're like, what is this? And you slowly realize that, oh, that place I briefly went to when I was going to Death Mountain with that magic mirror was a whole separate land. And holy cow, not only is there a whole separate land version of the game I've just been playing, but now there's seven additional dungeons. Are you kidding me? This is crazy. Like, it was, it was such a revelation being like, wow, I thought we were towards the end of the game. There's actually more. And that feeling, it's similar to what I had in Final Fantasy VII, but with this one, because it was Zelda, it was so good. Before this, I think the first Zelda had 10 dungeons, and the second Zelda had only about 7. And I didn't ever really play the first Zelda, I played the second Zelda. So getting into this one and realizing, oh, after we beat those three temples, there was so much more game left, and so much more to explore, and so much more to find, was just so cool. And another thing that, I mean, really didn't happen again for me until Final Fantasy VII, when it then took that small scope and exploded it. And it's never really been exploded since then, except on the level of a game like, say, World of Warcraft, which is going to be on this video as well. Not not exactly the way you would think. So for that, it was playing, I mean, just playing Classic WoW again. The Classic WoW launch was so nostalgic and great. But probably the high point for me, I mean, we clear, I cleared everything. I basically got to relive out my my 19-year-old fantasies, getting to Nax, getting full Tier 3 pretty much, getting the best weapons in the game, going to Rathy Basin and getting to 1v3, 1v2 people with my amazing geared rogue. But the thing that really sticks in my heart the most was being the server first kill on the ferry and when they released Blackwing Lair. We went at it hard for about six hours that night, but getting the server first head of Nefarian and dropping Nefarian's head in Ogremar and getting to just stand there on my horse like the nerds we were, knowing that Milky White, formerly Tice of Tempest, was the person who dropped the first Nefarian's head on Smolderweb and sitting there with my boys Slayer and Jake and the other people from my guild, I think Air was there. Just really cool. You know, one of those moments you can only get in gaming and really, really loved doing that. I mean, we did a 30-minute clear of ZG today. It came out, I think we were World 25th, which, again, this is classic WoW. It doesn't really matter. It's a 15-year-old game. Like, now it's almost a 20-year-old game. But just for me, myself, my, my gaming life, that's something that really 
I, you know, one of those feathers you put in your hat, and I really, really love that accomplishment. All right, now here's one that I did experience largely because I started doing this channel. So one of the big things that I wanted to start the channel with was when I found out there were games that came out back in the day that were not released in the United States, which for me was a real mind-blowing moment. I wanted to share that knowledge. That's why the entire first year of my channel is me covering a lot of these RPGs that were not released outside of Japan, or if they were, did not come to the States, one of which being Terranigma. Now, Terranigma is the third game in the unofficial Gaia trilogy. So that's Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, and then Terranigma. Terranigma, by most accounts, is the best of the three, and I will wholeheartedly agree. Now, I am not going to say anything about this because this is spoilers, but the ending of this game is so powerful in a way that you would not expect a 16-bit game to be. The whole fourth act of this game is really just, in a way where... I just recently beat Last of Us 2. Last of Us 2 tries to be heart-wrenching, but in a way where everyone's terrible and you don't care for anyone. Whereas in Terranigma, there's some horrible things that happen, but instead you have the human spirit that prevails and you have something that goes on that gives you and uplifts you, which I feel like was a lot more of just media in general when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, and more so now with all the nihilism and all the, uh, the people being doom and gloom. It just doesn't exist in a lot of what we're doing. But if you want something that really sticks with you and there's a beautiful score in it, Terranigma, phenomenal ending. I'm not going to say anything else other than that. You guys need to experience it. Hopefully one of these days we will get a re-release or a remaster or something. I mean, we got Secret of Mana 2, which is Trials of Mana, Terranigma's got to come out eventually. You would think they're sitting on money here, but who knows? I mean, Quintet's... Quintet, no one knows what the hell happened to one of the guys who created it, and the other guy, I, I don't know what he's up... I think he left the gaming industry. But yes, Terranigma's ending, phenomenal. Now, this is one that always sticks in my craw in a good way because it was the first time I was responsible for bringing a gaming moment into my household, and I was so proud. I was... I think I had to be 10, 10 or 11, um, and the game I'm talking about is Super Mario 64, so I bought the N64 with my own money, I bought Mario 64 with my own money, I saved for it that whole year, and we got it from some sort of store that I have no idea what it was, it was in the, the mall, the Hillsdale Mall, it wasn't KB Toys, it wasn't Toys R Us, it was someplace my dad found, I don't know if it was an exporter or importer, or what the hell it was, I'd never gone there before for anything, they got the N64 in two months early, and it was supposed to be, I think, $250 or something of that nature. And then they said, oh, yeah, it's actually $200. But you know what? We can give you the game for the same price you already paid. And, of course, I needed a game because it was the first system that didn't come bundled with the game. So I got Mario 64. And literally that whole day, just being the person to play it, my older brother came over because he was out of the house at this point. My dad was there, and they were just seeing me playing this game and knowing that they couldn't take the controller from me and that I was responsible for this and just blowing their minds too, who had played Mario 1, 2, 3, Mario World, and seeing, oh my God, what has gaming become? Like The, the graphics now, when you look at them, are so janky, but the, the difference between Mario World and Mario 64 especially if you were not following the gaming scene, was such an incredible leap. Same thing with the PS1 graphics. Going to Resident Evil 2 when you'd been playing something like... Um like the like Kid Icarus or Zelda 2 or something like it's just wow that the 3D rendering the ability to go through it was just incredible and going through those first few hours of Mario 64 and feeling like the hero that day was awesome and it it always is, is one of my favorite moments in gaming for myself. Now one that will be a little bit of a spoiler but I'm sorry this game is almost God, 30 years old now and that is Final Fantasy Tactics. Now, this probably is my favorite game of all time now, and what I loved about this game is that you think this is going to just be a political intrigue, game going back and forth, and then you find out towards the beginning of the first chapter, or the end of the first chapter, that there are these stones called the Lukavi Stones, and the whole game you've heard rumblings of the Zodiac Braves and these legends, like these legends, these myths, uh, much like um, Gilgamesh or Hercules or Zeus, then it turns out they're completely real, but they were not heroes. They were actually being possessed by demons. 
and these demons are terrible and terrifying and some of the hardest bosses in the entire game. And one of the guys who you follow in the first chapter is a gentleman named Weirgraf. And he is just one of these guys where you feel for him. He is a good person caught up in extraordinary circumstances and he just happens to be on the other side of the battle. And he gets himself his sister's killed. All these bad things happen. He's on his death's door. And he has one of these stones that at the time he does not know the secret of the stone because they do not reveal themselves until the person is weak enough to make an agreement. And so the stone reveals himself to Weirgraf and says, give me your strength and I'll allow you to live. And he gives in. And he gives in right in front of you and you don't want him to do it. And he becomes one of the Lukavi. Uh, I can't remember the... Uh, I can't remember... Zelius, I think? I think Zelius. And so immediately it's like, oh God, what happened? One of our favorite guys. And then later on, right then at the beginning of chapter two, the end of chapter two, you then have a battle with him where it's just one-on-one, -on -one, mono -a mono and it is one of the toughest fights in the entire game. You can get yourself stuck there. This is one of the noob gamers I've been waiting to do with Jen forever because the intensity of that battle. I had to scrape and claw by the skin of my teeth and I can't tell you how many times I've heard of people playing this game and getting to this check, this, essentially this checkpoint and being blown out of the water and stopping their journey in Fall Fantasy Tactics. So one of the most incredible fight sequences, one of the most incredible story sequences attached to it, where you have a character that you absolutely empathize with, who you want, because people get recruited, that's what happens, is you, you assume that, okay, this guy's going to eventually come on your side, but he doesn't, and it's so disappointing, and it's so, un, it's so stoppable, but you can't stop it, and that's the feeling that Final Fantasy Tactics gives you over and over and over again, is that why are things this way? And a lot of what Game of Thrones does, and what people loved about Game of Thrones, you can see the same sort of storytelling in this game, and that's the reason why there's people like me that are such zealots for it, and you just don't see it coming. And I'm not going to say anything else about it, but please, do yourself a, to self a favor and play Final Fantasy Tactics. If you haven't, it is incredible. Everything about that game is amazing. All right. Now, here's one that is just stupid fun, but it really stuck with me. I always say that there's two games on the Genesis that made me keep my Genesis. That's Toe Jam and Earl and then Mutant League Hockey. And what this game did is it was just, I mean, even more so than NBA Jam, you could beat up, destroy enemies, get a chainsaw, blow them up, <laughs> but... I, for some reason, when I played this as like 8 or 9, I just could not get enough of the people falling through the ice. Especially when the hole in the ice hadn't been made. And just seeing them and be like, oh! And then seeing their bodies float underneath the ice for the rest of the quarter was just hilarious. And a stupid one, I know, but I just, I loved it. And one of those things that really, really makes me smile anytime I think about it. Now, here's another recent one that this one is kind of tied to the whole experience of it. And that game is Fury. So Fury has some of the best music, heart pumping, that I've ever heard. I'd never heard of the term Synthwave before this game, but I am absolutely a Synthwave fan. Carpenter Brute, one of the guys who does the music in this, is incredible. And I just, I, I can't get enough of it. The, the Your Mind song from this is actually the theme song I use to start my videos. That's how much I like it. Well, there you can beat this game on Fury mode, which is hard as hell. And then it unlocks Furier. And Furier, you think you can, do, you, like with this whole game, you think you can't do anything. You're running your head against the wall. And then it clicks. And then you just progress. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a boss fight after boss fight game. And it's almost a, a bullet hell shooter. And then you get into a one-on-one -on -one fighter. But it's nothing like either of those. It is incredible. Every single fight is unique. Every single fight is different. And then once you get to Furrier mode, it opens it up and makes it even more complicated. You have even more things to avoid. And you start feeling so badass if you can overcome this. That it just, it leaves you so dripping in adrenaline that I just... I, I yearn for that feeling. It is so intense and so good and exactly what I want from a single player game. And I cannot tell you guys how much I enjoy that game and how thankful I am that I discovered that game when it was on PS Plus of all things. So definitely do yourself a favor. Check it out. Give it a feel. Don't give up. Don't give up on it because if you keep going, it'll give you one of the most satisfying conclusions if you can overcome it. I mean, I think I got to the point where I was able to beat the Furrier version. I did it on a stream once and I did it in an hour uh, with only a couple of deaths and it was fun. It was really fun. 
All right, another game that I talk about to death. It's funny, I talk about probably my, my top 10 of, uh, most of my favorite games of all time literally are on this video. It makes sense why they're up there if they're my favorite moments. Uh, that's XCOM Enemy Unknown. And really this is because of the stories that get made in this. You get to name your characters. So I, I've spoken about two of the stories from Un Unknown that I really liked. One of them was in regards to a gentleman named, uh, named Christopher Hawk that me and my wife knew. We did shows of him. I named a character after him and then he became just a badass on my team so much so that we wanted to hang out with the real guy but the real guy was like didn't want to hang out with us and then the other one was the um the the suicide mission where we had characters i had one named after uh, at the time barack obama was our president so just we named him like all right we had uh, we had obama and i think we had a couple other people in our squad but he was one of the only ones left and he was just going around with a shotgun shaking on the chrysalids which because of the way XCOM works, the deeper in the game you get, the more complicated enemies they send you. Somehow we ended up in a scenario where we didn't quite get to the, the Muton enemies. So we just had the suicide mission where there was like 12 of these chrysalids. And what they do is they zerg you. They do a bunch of damage. They have tons of armor. And then if they kill you, it brings you back as a zombie. And then you have to deal with that. So the shotgun guys were the, the best ones to go out and take them out. So Obama was going out there blasting these chrysalids and he took out like 10 of them. And finally, right at the last second, there we, we were down to the three of us. We had Obama and our two snipers and he goes down to the last chrysalid so sad, we take out the last chrysalid with the sniper, but then it blacks out the arena. And then we know, oh no, because we didn't know it was the last chrysalid, we assumed it was. So we had, I had both our snipers go back and post up, and then he just comes shambling at us as a zombie. And it was one of those things like, like Shawn Michaels to Ric Flair, I'm sorry, and then he had to take him out after he saved the squad. We were stuck, we were hard stuck on this mission. I didn't think we'd be able to get past it. I actually started a secondary playthrough at my house because this was on the playthrough that me and my older brother were doing but we got through we got through that mission and just that story is one of the, those things that it sticks with you and why i am such a fan of that game all right now this one's another just really kind of the vibe of the game and that is skyrim as overblown as Skyrim is, as overhyped as it is now, when it first came out, the level of exploration and that true openness for someone who was not a PC gamer, so it wasn't something that I had, had like I didn't have the Baldur's Gates or the Icewind Dales or the Morrowinds or any other, even playing Oblivion, I went through Oblivion and I picked a stupid build, so it really screwed over my playthrough. With Skyrim, I was like, I'm going through it. I'm being a warrior. I'm getting a two-handed weapon, and I'm blasting anything that comes my way. And it did, and it made the game so enjoyable. And just feeling like I played Skyrim for a scrape month or two in 2011 when it came out. And it was just every day was like, all right, let's see what's over there. Wow, I can go explore that. That's cool. And just that openness and that feeling could not be rivaled and I enjoyed it so much. The stories I had, one of my favorite ones was I got to a tower and a, a guy at the bottom was like, my wife's stuck at the top of the tower, can you please go rescue her? Well, you get up to the top of the tower and the wife be like, oh yeah, I, I, I don't want that loser anymore, I left him. And then you're forced to kill her and then you go down to the tower and be like, sorry mate, I killed your wife and he attacks you. And I had this, this build option where you can behead people randomly. So he goes to attack me and I dodged it. I hit him and then I see the beheading proc is happening. And I'm like, no, yes. And just the fact that I was just spent, I spent an hour trying to help you a quest NBC to have this happen. I would imagine these are the type of scenarios that people love so much in that new Baldur's Gate 3 game, which has me looking forward to playing it. But that was just so cool and really really just made me a fan of that open world style of game, which when it came down to Breath of the Wild, really hammered it home because now not only was I in a world that I was used to, mechanics I was used to, vibes I was used to, but now I'm doing it with one of my favorite game characters and coming out of the cave, I say it all the time, was such a beautiful moment. It really was because Nintendo had been down and out for a while. The Wii U did not do well. The Wii for myself was a disappointment. I had not been a heavy, I was a heavy Nintendo fanboy my whole life. I was always Nintendo everything, everything, everything. I stopped playing when WoW was fresh 
and then I got an Xbox 360 and I really was not all that hot on Nintendo. I picked up the Wii U, but still I didn't play it that much. And getting into Breath of the Wild and feeling like they finally were not sending an apology, but doing right by the hardcore gaming people that were Nintendo fans and never betrayed them and went off to Sony or Xbox. It just, it felt like that's what that whole moment was. And yes, I know that game was on the Wii U, but really that set the Switch up for just an amazing run, which it's never slowed down from, and who knows if it ever will. I mean, we're still waiting for the Switch too, right? I'm sure it'll come one of these days. But yes, that moment, that feeling in Breath of the Wild that really was, that seasoned itself five, six years earlier with Skyrim, really hit it home. And then the fact that not only could you go anywhere, you could climb anything, and you could discover anything around any corner, and you could tackle it, even if it was way too hard, because you had bombs that you could blow up enemies. Like, I killed one of those giant Enoxes with bombs, and I spent about 30 minutes doing it. Which, in Tears of the Kingdom, you couldn't do, because you had no basic damaging spell. Every one of your spells was about building or about manipulation of things, but you couldn't damage with it. And that is why I did not really care for it anywhere as much as I cared for Breath of the Wild. All right, last three here. This is a quick one. Smash Brothers Melee. Finding out who Marth and Roy were. That was, I mean, that really should have given me a hint back then that there were games that we didn't get here in the U.S. I don't know why it didn't. But finding out there was a franchise named Fire Emblem, and it was big enough in Japan to be included in the premier mascot fighter for Nintendo, and also having them be really cool characters and a fun-as-hell one to play with, and great theme music, too. The Fire Emblem recruit, recruit theme was really cool, was very interesting, and one of those moments where I was like, wow, there's, there's, there's more outside this bubble that I'm even aware of. And then this one... God, really, really set this franchise up. One of the first games I got for the Xbox 360, and that was Mass Effect 2. This was finally something that brought me back to single-player games, because for a while there, after a while, I was lambasting in Call of Duties and in Halos. Only online, only multiplayer. I would dabble a little bit with download titles like Bastion, but then Mass Effect 2, which I didn't even play the first one, and I took a risk. I never jump into sequels, but I took a risk with it, and getting in it was incredible, and the suicide mission at the end of the game, where you can basically lose anyone on your squad, everyone even, and even the main character, and there's nothing you could do about it, was so heart pumping. And the fact that it was like, wow, I need to get through this so that I can set it up and have everyone available in the sequel. I didn't realize at the time that really didn't matter because you couldn't use basically any of them in Mass Effect 3. But at the time, it felt like it mattered. And it really just made that such an intense sequence and such a cool ending to a phenomenal game. A phenomenal style of game that I wasn't aware of before. The Bioware style where you have the chat tree option going around. And now, of course, I'm well versed in it. But still, very good game. And then the last one, the last one here is a little bit of a personal one. So my, my best friend, Sean, the one who passed away about a year and a half ago now to cancer his favorite game was final fantasy 3 slash 6 and so i played this game for the channel after hearing about it for years and i think part of it now you know it, it, at the time i knew the opera scene was incredible but now it's hard for me not to connect my feelings with my my best friend with this game because he it was his favorite game and so that really piles onto it and it adds so much more layers to that opening with the robots in the in the snow or the silliness of something like ultras on the river or the opera scene in general so just this game now holds a very special plate in my heart and the fact that those those moments that meant so much to him also for me have now been enhanced and you know i just that that it's it it holds it up there and now i gotta include it in a video like this Nice move. All right, so those are what I think are the greatest moments in gaming. What do you guys think the greatest moments in gaming are? There's other ones, by all means. I'm sure I could do another part two of this. Let me know if you're interested in that. Let me know what you guys thought of this video. And just, you know, thank you again. Thank you again. We are so close. We are 48 subs away from 2,000. I, I'm working on that backlog, so I got one of them down, 13 more to go. I'll probably try and, like I said, I'm trying to set up a stream where I discuss sort of the progress I'm doing on the backlog, and then at some point this year we'll make a video about it. But yeah, we'll, we'll have more news on that. 
But thank you guys again. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, subscribing, sharing, commenting. I just, I'm so grateful to be where I'm at with you guys and talking about things I love. So yes, it's been so nice getting a hold of you. Take care. Thank you.